Welcome to the Council for a Parliament of the World's Religions webinar series. I'm Louis Cardinal. I serve on the Board of Trustees for the Council. Following today's presentation, we'll have time to take questions from our listeners. At any point during the webinar, you may type questions into the box on the screen. Today's webinar is entitled Top 10 Tips to Speak Prophetically Through the Press and features Mackie Alston. Mackie Alston is an award-winning filmmaker and an organizer of the worlds of media and religion. He has received two Sundance Film Festival Awards, the Gotham Open Palm Award, three Emmy nominations, and has appeared on the Oprah Winfrey Show, the Today Show, and the New York Times. He is currently screening his new documentary, Love Free or Die, about Gene Robinson, the first openly gay person to become a bishop in the high church traditions of Christendom. Love Free or Die will air on PBS this October. Welcome back. Thank you, Lewis, and I'm thrilled to be uh, with the uh, uh, Council for the Parliament of World's Religions and with all those gathered. Uh, on this late summer morning. Hope everybody's had a great summer, and I'm just thrilled that you prioritize this topic and this hour as we all head into the fall. Uh, a, a, a few words about Auburn Seminary, where I work, and Auburn Media. Auburn Seminary is a 200-year-old institution that has been, uh, in pioneering ways, helping religious voices clergy, experts on religion, uh, speak out for justice, uh, to heal and repair the world, uh, on, all, on all kinds of issues from era to era. Uh, today, we're in New York City, so I'm looking out my window up the Hudson at the Tower of Riverside Church, uh, just across the street from Union Theological, New York Theological, in the Interchurch Center. Uh, and. Uh, what Auburn does now is innovative ways of helping religious voices on the front lines of leadership. So as uh, Auburn Media, in particular since 2002, has media trained over 2,000 voices who speak out for justice and speak to uh, educate on issues of religion, faith, and public life. And so we're thrilled to bring all that we've learned in that work to you all today and to add you to that large community of folks. Um, and I think it's wonderful to see ourselves as a part of that greater body of folks who are committed to not just speaking from our classrooms and our pulpits, but in the 21st century, understanding that the classroom and pulpit of our day largely is the media, whether it is a blog you write, on the internet, whether it is a interview you take with a local um, press outlet, which of course means it's international because it's also online, whether it's local television or radio, uh, everything uh, almost is international news now because it's up online. And what can be local news, uh, this hour can be international news, the next hour because of how news now travels. And our voices matter particularly in this election year, uh, as we see the faith voices line up at the National Convention, and as we see the faith voices weigh in on all the critical issues of our time, in the op-ed pages, on television, and on radio, it's up to us to determine whether or not our points of view get heard. And what I have learned through my experience as a member of the mainstream press but also in my work um, with Auburn Seminary as I have uh, uh, studied theology at Union Theological Seminary, as I am um, the son and grandson and great-grandson of Presbyterian ministers committed to justice in the American South, is that uh, we are the ones we've been waiting for, and this is the time that people are looking for our voices. We speak with workers all the time. Uh, assistants to producers in television and radio, as well as the journalists themselves, and they say, who do we turn to? Who should we talk to? I think that one way is to know who to refer them to, but the, the best way is for you all communicate out to the press that you are here, uh, particularly with the content, with the message that you believe the world needs to hear. If it's that hot, 
if it's that timely, and if it's in the kinds of formats that the press can easily consume, I guarantee you, you can break through. So I'm going to uh, focus today on our top 10 tips. Uh, primarily, these tips will help you prepare for an interview. But secondarily, they will help you think about how to prepare for an op-ed that you might write, write on the opinion pages of uh, the newspapers or online. Uh, they can even help you prepare for a public speaking engagement, for a panel discussion. This is how to organize your thoughts, how to anticipate the audience you're speaking to, how to think in a timely fashion so you're not just telling the world what you have to say, but entering into the conversations that the world that you're trying to reach are having. That's what these top 10 tips address. After that, we will focus on how to prepare uh, for one of these interviews in regard to uh, what you want to say, arranging your message in a format uh, that is uh, that, that genuinely prepares for these interviews where any question uh, can be asked. Nothing is off limits. You may go to talk about poverty and somebody's first question might be about some other social issue or even what you think about the Super Bowl last night. So preparing your message so that you are ready uh, for anything as it comes. So I'm going to ask us to turn to the uh, next page on this um, PDF, which I hope everybody has received in downloadable form, but you can look at your screen and see. What I would ask you to um, think about right now is an interview you might be preparing for in the next week or months to come. Put your head in the space that everything I'm saying is going to be a plot. So right now, imagine that everything I'm recommending to you, uh, you're taking to heart for an interview you're about to do. And this can apply to other kinds of press you might generate. And I'm very interested in us generating um, media as well as jumping into um, the current media outlets, being interviewed by them, being both uh, proactive and also engaged. But right now, think about that one interview you might do. The, the, the meta tip, the biggest tip, which isn't even on this page, is media training is all about helping you be your most authentic self. It is not about uh, being like they are on TV, being like they are on radio, mimicking somebody's uh, successful engagement trying to be like them. No, it's being uh, your true self in all formats. You know those moment, moments when you're in the pulpit or when you're with the best friend and you are uh, speaking your truth from your heart and you can feel it in your gut. It's that I don't know everything, but uh, this I know for sure. And almost nothing in a moment like that when you are so connected to your body and to the truth you have to tell can throw you off your message or off your game. That's the place you want to be when you are uh, in an interview. And when I was on the Oprah Winfrey show, for example, um, they called me two days in advance of the interview. And for two days I thought about what I was going to wear, but not for a minute about what I was going to say. So... Imagining that she was a pro, this was at the very beginning of my professional career 20 years ago, I figured that she wanted me on her show, she had pre-interviewed me, she was going to do the work, and all I had to do was look nice. Of course, that's not the, 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 the job here. The job is to go in there and take control of that interview and bring it. Bring what you've come to say in your most authentic voice. It would have helped me if I had chosen a story on Oprah that grounded me in my truest self and started with that story and then moved from that story to my core message. More on that in a minute. But again, if everybody will just write down on some piece of paper near them, be authentic, as the biggest tip we have for you. Uh, it's when we think it. It's when we pretend to be somebody we're not that we often are most easily vulnerable to being thrown off our game. Rule number one, the golden rule, just as I said on Oprah, 
And somebody actually leaned over to me on Oprah after the first commercial break saying, breathe, it's going to be okay. And just whatever she asks, say what you've come to say. That's tip number one. In response to the first question they asked, know what you want to say, say it right away, and make me care. When I say know what you want to say, I mean if you've got one line, one sentence that's going to run in the New York Times, what's that sentence verbatim? Write that out before you go on to an interview. Go ahead and write that sentence right now. Again, pretending that you are preparing for an interview. What's the one thing you'd like somebody to come away from this interview knowing? Or reporting that you uh, said in this interview. It's not a defeat if all you do is get one line, of course, on all things considered on NPR or in any uh, print publication. They get a sentence from you, a sentence from somebody on the other side, a sentence from an academic, and a sentence from the person on the ground. That's, a, that's an article. So what's that one sentence you'd like to go out with? And then in response to my first question, again, that's what you're going to say right away. Now, do you bridge from what I asked to what you have come to say? Sure. But I'd rather you be awkward and just say what you've come to say than not say what you've come to say. And that may lead you down a rabbit hole. We'll talk more about bridging in a bit. But then the, the last bit in this first tip is you've got to make me care. I'm going to give you an example of a uh, religious leader with whom we worked. His messaging prepared for an interview on MSNBC. I don't want you to judge the content of what he said. I just want you to use this example as you think about uh, preparing for your own interview. His core message was, as a Christian pastor and as an American, I believe that poverty is the number one crisis we face in America today. That was his core message. The way he made me care, though, was that, that right, right after that, he said, I was born in the poverty. So were my nine brothers and sisters, and we all ended up with PhDs because our parents knew the value of a good education, something America has to wake up to. So again, as a Christian pastor and an American, I'm here to tell you that poverty is the number one crisis we face in America today. But as someone who grew up in poverty, I'm here to tell you that it's a solvable problem. Take it from me. In that moment, he made me care. More about messaging in a bit. The second point. Be clear on who you want to reach through your media work. Too often, we imagine that we want to reach everybody. Do that often. We write for, um, for the local paper. In the radio interview we do. In the sermon we write. We recommend that you identify one human being who you would like to move, who you would like to reach, who you'd like to educate, who you'd like to galvanize in the interview. So go ahead and write somebody down. Right now, I just made this documentary, Love for Your Die, and the person that I'm trying to reach is a cousin of mine. We'll call him Andrew. He lives uh, down south, and he uh, loves me and loves my family, and loves a lot of people who are lesbian and gay, uh, but he doesn't support us because of his Christian conviction. He doesn't see how he could both be a Christian and be someone who supports um, uh, equality. And so I made this film to try to address him. And in a sense, much of the language of the film really has his language in mind. You don't have to agree with me on any issue. But I do want you to think about who you're trying to reach and how you might move or educate that person specifically. You want to know what his or her language is, what will move that person, what cultural references that person holds dear. And then you want to, not in an inauthentic way, but in an authentic way, speak into that person's language, worldview, social location. There, if you can imagine a Venn diagram of what you know and what you hold dear and what that person knows and holds dear, that crossover is where you want to meet. But you have to know who you're talking to in order to know where you connect. So please, everybody, go ahead and write one person's name down. 
my aunt Veronica, um, my um, local representative. Write that one person's name down. Be clear on who you want to reach through your media work. Moving to number three, you need to prepare for an interview with some kind of messaging strategy. One of the revelations in my media training work was that talking points is a problematic method of message preparation for an interview. Why? Because in a sense, when you're in an interview, it's almost like being in a boxing ring. You don't know what punch the journalist is going to pull. Hopefully you've studied the way the journalist plays, the way the journalist works, what punches she is likely to pull, he is likely to pull. But you, you never know what's going to come first. And we'll talk more about being prepared to be caught off guard in a minute. But you've come with the notion that you know what your best touches are, and whatever she or he um, pulls, you're ready. The problem with the talking point strategy is, in a sense, it's a linear format. So you think, first I'm going to say this, then I'm going to say this, then I'm going to say this, then I'm going to say that. The journalist comes in and says, oh, you know, I was planning to talk to you for 15 minutes, but as a matter of fact, I just need one quote. And we were going to talk about poverty, but my first question is actually about abortion. Where do you go on that talking point strategy, where you thought you had a different uh, amount of time, and where you thought you could really build your argument in a linear fashion? We're going to recommend that you think in a nonlinear fashion as you hear your messaging, and we'll get to that in a bit. But I guarantee you, having spoken to 8 million people on Oprah without having prepared my message, having a lot to say, but not having boiled down my one sentence, you've got to prepare. Point number four. Before you agree to take an interview, review the reporter and the media source. By that I mean... If Larry Goodstein from the New York Times religion reporter has called you and wants to talk to you about, say, the election, I guarantee you it will benefit you to Google her and see what the last three articles she's written on the issue are. She is going down a trail. She is telling a larger story. This is her beat. So you want to know the trail she's on that led her to you. It's just uh, proper preparation, frankly respectful. It will help you uh, speak directly uh, into the conversation that she's having with her husband. But also, it's one way to um, protect yourself. The media is not the enemy. I went into doing media work, as so many people at Auburn Media did. We have a team now of six or seven folks, including the former editor-in-chief of Oprah Magazine, Susan Reed, an Emmy Award-winning uh, producer, the now Reverend Kelly Anderson Pacayo, members of the mainstream press who also are uh, deeply committed to um, religious voices guiding us all through these difficult times on the issues that are critical uh, to us, to our children, to our organizations, to our communities, to our country, and to our world. There are media allies out there, and you want to engage them. You want to think of them almost as you might your donors in your organization or in your congregation. You want to be in relationship with them, thinking of them not as friends necessarily, but as professional allies. And you want to treat those relationships with great care. The media is not the enemy. That said, there are some snakes in the grass out there. And I guarantee you we have worked with um, high-profile religious leaders who have come to us because they didn't Google the reporter who was calling them for an interview, an interview they granted, that lost them serious ground on the issues that they care about and in some cases for people in their careers. So there are interviews you don't want to take by Googling the reporter and find out if the person who is calling is in fact a snake in the grass. And I will uh, share with you later in this talk a form with some basic questions that you're going to want to ask uh, people who call you, the booker, the intern, the reporter, the correspondent, before you agree to take the interview, including what's your deadline? 
When a reporter calls, you don't want to take that interview right away. You want to say something like, you know, I have somebody in the office right now. I'd love to talk to you, but I'm going to call you back at your deadline. Sometimes that reporter will be saying, I need a quote right away. And by that, you mean, you mean she means now. And you ask, what's your deadline? And she'll say, in two days. And you suddenly realize that right away means this week instead of right now. You can buy yourself some serious time. You can Google that, that reporter. Decide whether or not you want to take the interview, decide what you want to say, prepare to be caught off guard in all kinds of ways, and we'll talk about that in a minute. Before you agree to take an interview, review the reporter and the media source. Does that media source connect with the audience, the people you're trying to reach? The cousin, the aunt, the local representative, who you're trying to reach? If not, why are you going to spend valuable time taking this interview? This is not dignity work, media work. It's mission work. I will just leave your mission. Moving to the next point. Prepare to be caught off guard. When I say Google the reporter, I often bridge in this next bullet to um, review yourself. I guarantee you, the journalist, myself included, before uh, we've called you, we've Googled you. So Google yourself before an interview. And remember, too, that when you're Googling yourself on your computer, uh, your search engine is not the same as the journalist's search engine based on uh, the cookies that are in your computer or hers or his. In other words, the various searches that you've done in the past shape your search engine. So don't only just Google yourself, but Google your name and key words that are relevant to the interview as well as um, the issues of the day as well as things you worry might be out there about you that you might uh, not want that journalist to know. As someone who, for whom uh, religion was my family business, I know that you don't have to be in this business very long before you are in and around uh, stories that dog uh, religious communities, stories of financial mismanagement, sometimes stories of sexual misconduct, the hot button issues uh, that are out there that are tied to our religious communities, uh, our religious denominations, whether they are same sex marriage, abortion, school prayer, church and state, 501c3 status. So you want to Google some of those keywords with your name and see what comes up. That is what the reporter is doing. Prepare to be caught off guard. Another way to prepare to be caught off guard is. You must read, do the equivalent of read the, the national paper right before your interview. Now, of course, that's relatively easy. We can do it electronically. So know what is happening right now in the world. If the hurricane has suddenly struck, if Hurricane Isaac has suddenly hit with uh, casualties that uh, it happened just hours ago, you're going to want to know that because I guarantee you questions will uh, likely be asked, if not you, then some of the people who come on the show. And you want to reference that. You want to be uh, in the know, in the imagination of your listeners, viewers, readers. You want to speak to their hearts, speak to their minds, and speak relevantly. Prepare to be caught off guard. Here's a story. If you take our media training, you've heard, but I tell it as much as I can because it's such a cautionary tale. And again, I don't think the moral of this story is that media uh, professionals are equal. I just think that there are there, you never know what might be asked, and you need to meet any question strategically instead of defensively. Uh, and again, by by this, I mean questions like who did you vote for, how much do you make. Um, have you, uh, are you married? Are you gay? Have you ever had an affair? All of these things really can come your way. And so rather than say, how dare you, uh, I think it's wiser to bridge from that question uh, into the content that you might bring. Here's a story. I was media training a famous nun, a Catholic nun, and she had been called by a Ted Koppel type. Uh, or his booker, to be on a round table of national television on the war in Iraq. Now, she was against the war in Iraq, and so she was excited about being on this round table. But she told the booker, the person who was pre-interviewing her and trying to get her on the show, 
that she would go on the show on one condition, that she couldn't talk about abortion. And if any questions were going to be raised about abortion, she couldn't even go on the show because uh, she was she and her community were trying to figure out how to preach and teach and think and get to policy on this issue. And it was behind the scenes work, and it was it was too early to go out and go for, like, on that conversation. The booker said no problem. She said I'm in. Cameras were rolling. She was on the show. The type, Apple type turned to her with a smile, warm look, face that America trusts, and said, Sister so and so, we thrilled your ear, love your work. Before we dive into this conversation about the war, I just have one question for you. What's your take on abortion? Well, she slammed her hands down on the table, forgive the noise, but that's what it was like. She stared right into the tech couple type's eye, gave him the look of death, and stormed off set. Well, look, that's some good television, right? Perhaps he got what he wanted, a dramatic moment. But of course, she regretted it, because people out there, my cousin, your aunt, the local representative, would have thought, what is up with the nun? And why can't she deal with an issue that all America is talking about? And of course, after we trained, after we worked, what she said, uh, that she wished she had done was said, oh, Ted, love your show. Thrilled to be back on it. And you know what? I'd love to come back another day to talk about abortion, a critical issue of our day. But today, we're here to talk about the war. This war must end. Make the story. Make me care. That's what she wished she had done. All with a smile. Now, whether she would have taken Ted Koppel or, or, or his book or to task later, that's up to her. What does she have to gain from that? This is strategic work. This, her goal in doing media is mission-based work. If she wants to be on that show again, she has to understand that um, anything can happen, and then it's up to her to stay on message, and um, she can do a lot uh, if she's prepared to be caught off guard to bridge right back to her core message. A couple more points, and then we're going to talk about messaging. Communicate everything you have to say in your first statement. There might not be a second question, so get it out. Third, uh, seventh, the seventh point is make it personal. By that, I don't mean you have to talk about yourself. You can talk about uh, a, a famous figure in your religious tradition. And it's no accident. You know, we are people of the story. And this work is about storytelling. Uh, modern media is as story-based as our sacred texts and scriptures are, and that's just because that's how humans are wired. And I guarantee you, if we are moving the heart, that's how we can get to folks, and then we will have um, opportunities to move the mind. But that's the way we've got to go, and again, as religious um, people, as experts on religion, we ought not to be surprised that we have passed down our our, our wisdom, our ethics, our law, uh, our histories, wrapped in the cloak of story. So we have to do that in very short form uh, in the media today. Make it personal. Again, we are also treasure troves of stories in our congregations, in our communities. We need to audit our communities for great stories. We need to tell the specifics of our stories. And um, heartbreakingly, I'll reference the Trayvon Martin case. The reason that that story captured the imagination of America was because of Skittles and I see. The boy, the young man, was walking back from the gas station, from the convenience store, with Skittles and I see in his hand. And I thought immediately, literally, about my daughter, who last week came back from the candy store with Skittles. And suddenly Trayvon was my child. That's how we win the imagination of the people we're trying to reach. Make it personal. Make it religious. So this is my biggest message to you all. If a journalist is coming to you, a religious voice for a religious perspective, even if you're an expert on religion, you don't have to, to hold the religious view. But if you don't speak religiously or speak to religion, then, frankly, the journalist is going to go elsewhere. Too often, um, we religious folks, when we're speaking to journalists, provide platitudes that are, in effect, secular point of view, 
that everyone should be free, that we stand for equality, that we are against poverty, but we don't wrap it in our Sikh or Jain or Muslim or Christian or Jewish tradition, root it in our um, values and in our stories, in our religious stories. And again, when they're coming to us as journalists, or when the public is listening to us, to get Christian or Jewish or Muslim or Sikh or Jewish, whatever perspective, we've got to deliver it. Otherwise, they're flapping in the wind. They just don't know where to turn for the range of religious perspectives on the range of views that matter. Make it religious. Deliver your message with confidence. That's number nine. This work is best done in partnership. You need to prepare your message in advance. You need to run it by somebody you trust, somebody who will say, I love you. Normally you're funny, but don't tell that joke on Oprah. That joke is not funny. You need the person to be uh, up on the issues, be a regular partner with you. Again, this can be a life partner. It can be a professional partner. It can be a communications partner where you work. But you want to do this with a partner. And then when you go on Oprah, when you go to the local press, when you speak to the press chair to help up, whatever it may be, you've already tested your message on somebody you trust. And then when you're on Oprah or anywhere and you believe that Divine is suddenly speaking to you, my recommendation would be when you're on air and you suddenly have something new to say, save it for next time and deliver what you brought. Better that you do well, better that you deliver the message that you came to deliver rather than <coughs> you say something that suddenly comes, came to you and the double entendre that you didn't anticipate is evident to the whole public, and that torpedoes the conversation and sometimes your cause or career. When you know what you've come to say and you deliver only that, you can be confident because you have decided ahead of time that it's good enough. Good enough is good enough. And finally, 10, track and jump into what we call the four ropes. In a sense, when you're doing media work, not unlike when you are doing preaching and teaching, we imagine that there are conversations that the public is having that you might want to reference to make your content, your methods relevant to conversations that are already taking place. And that's us uh, doing media work or taking an interview, almost jumping double dutch style into these four jump ropes. Let me define what I mean by these jump ropes. One conversation that's always going on that journalists need to uh, report on year in and year out, uh, is tied to the secular calendar. Labor Day is just around the corner. Journalists will be reporting on Labor Day. With labor, jobs, a living wage, these are issues that a lot of people faith care about. So we can uh, immediately, even today, write an op-ed for a local paper, the national or international paper, create a blog on Labor Day, and then that can be pushed out virally it can be um, uh, immediately integrated in conversations that are people having because on Labor Day, at least everybody will say those words Labor Day and what does this really mean uh, once. So the secular calendar, that's one of the jump ropes you're jumping into. The liturgical calendars, the religious calendars, whether it's Ramadan or Passover or Christmas, the reporters have to, again, write some story find somebody to op-ed on our sacred calendars, year in and year out. And many of these journalists are tired of the same old story. So if you see Passover coming down the path, and you're a month out, reach out to your local uh, op-ed page or to the religion reporter and say, I've got a great angle uh, that makes it timely in relation to this post-election year or this election year. For Labor Day, uh, that makes it timely in regard to um, the mission based work that's happening in my congregation or my organization, that makes it fresh and local. You better believe that they're going to be interested because you are uh, helping them out on a beat that they've got to cover. So we've got the secular calendar, the liturgical calendar, two more jump ropes, and then I want to talk about messaging. The last two jump ropes are, of course, current events. Current events right now are the Republican National Convention and the, um, the hurricane. Everybody's reporting on it. We're all talking about it. 
what do you what do you have to say? How can you provide a faith message? How can you provide a um, this message based on those two things. Well, religious voices are doing it all over the wires right now. What, how, how might you spin it? What do you have to say to interpret that which we're all talking about? And then fourthly, the fourth jump rope <clears throat> is pop culture. Uh, we, we often do this from the pulpit and in the classroom, but if everybody's talking about the Super Bowl, it behooves you to reference it as well. If everybody, and by everybody I mean, millions and millions of Americans are talking about who won American Idol last night, then for you to say, oh, I can watch that show, immediately others you. And that's not to your benefit. I don't want you to be authentic to who you are, but if everybody is having a conversation at the water cooler, you might as well join them there and help them think about some way to look at what we're all talking about from a lens that matters to you and ought to matter for them. So for jump up liturgical, secular, current events, and pop culture. It's hard to make everybody talk about and think about what you care about if it's not already on their mind. So how do you um, take a conversation that's already happening out there and direct it your way? People are doing it on the op-ed pages all the time. So I want you to look down at this next page, the Auburn Media Method Game Strategy. And my homework assignment to you is going to be to read these pages and to apply the core message that you wrote, that one sentence, uh, into this grid. What this is, is a nonlinear format to map out your ideas uh, before you go into an interview. I learned this strategy from Bill and Hillary Clinton's media trainers who in 2004, when I went to a trade conducted, said what I am uh, preaching to you all, uh, a linear talking points format is not going to work for you. You need to be able to think on your toes. So if you flip down a page or two, what I want you to see is this worksheet, the messaging strategy worksheet. Imagine a triangle. In the middle of the triangle, imagine that core message that you've already written. The example I gave was, uh, as a Christian pastor and as an American, what I know is that poverty is the number one crisis we face in America today. If that's the, all, the only quote that that pastor had uh, been able to effectively deliver on MSNBC, he would win. Everything else is gravy. But then, to have three ideas around the core message in the middle of that triangle that support and undergird your core message is what I'm recommending. Three options. Three punches you could pull in that boxing ring. And I don't mean to have a, a fighter uh, metaphor, but at the same time, I want you to be aggressive. I want you to be in charge of this interview. And what I recommend, as you see the idea one, idea two, idea three, is that you think of these ideas as different kinds of statements. Right now, right down up around idea one, that this should be your value statement. Idea two should be your problem statement. What's the problem? What's the matter? What's the issue? Why should I even care? What are the stakes? Idea three should be your um, solution statement, the good news. What's the way out? Often there'll be a call to action there. And then in the supporting points under these ideas that you see, one, two, three, cover your triangle with stories, personal stories. Tell me their name. If it's about immigration and you can't tell me the name of the person because it might put that person in jeopardy, then I can't even tell you her name, but let's call her Marie. Just dignifying that story, the person in that story with a name, goes a long way in terms of occupying my imagination. The story, short form story, statistics. Give me one good statistic that helps define the poverty that you, the, the, the problem, the issue, the matter, the stakes in concrete terms. And a call to action. Uh, make it specific. You can mention your website. You can mention a book you've written. You can mention. Uh, 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 a congregation to come down to. So pepper it with stories, references to sacred texts, statistics, and specific ways to get involved. 
I'm going to run through uh, for one minute what this person did on MSNBC as an example, and then I implore you after this call is over to fill this sheet out. This pastor's core message was, as a Christian pastor and as an American, what I know is that poverty is the number one crisis we face in America today. His value statement, anticipating the question that didn't the Bible say, didn't Jesus say that the poor would always be with us? His value statement was ending poverty was the main priority of Jesus Christ, my Lord and Savior. And then he referenced core central texts of his tradition, the Good Samaritan story. When, when I was hungry, you fed me, that text. Uh, the gospel was all about good news for the poor. That was his idea of what his value statement. See how located it is in his tradition. That doesn't mean everybody has to be Christian, but this is where he comes from. Idea two, the problem statement. One out of four children is born under the poverty line in America today. Poverty is a cycle that's almost impossible to break out of. That's not okay. And you can even say one out of four kids is born under the poverty line in America. Let's give them names. Let's call them John, Marie, George. Somebody we trained said to the journalist, do you have a child? The journalist said, yes, my child's name is Alice. And suddenly everybody was imagining their child born under the poverty line. That's the state. And then idea three for this person was poverty is a solvable problem. And there he put his personal story. I was born under, I was born into poverty, so were my nine brothers and sisters. We all ended up with PhDs. He could talk there about his church-based program that has a great uh, track record of, of getting families out of poverty. He could talk about a country like Finland where it's not okay to be poor, where the government really cares. That's how he mapped his triangle. And then whatever the journalist said, he was ready. In every case, he said his core message. Remember that in these interviews, just because you're on Bill Moyers for an hour, or Krista Tippett, or Moyne Fiedler, or Wilton Gaddy, or wherever for an hour, doesn't mean the listener is. The listener may be coming in at the 35 minute mark and out at the pre So you have to keep saying your core message over and over. The core message is your victory. If you stay on message, you win. The last thing I want to show you is this media contact sheet. When you, when you get off the phone the first time, or your assistant, or your communications director, um, ask them these questions. Who else are you interviewing? What is your deadline? Spell your name. What part of the newspaper? Can I get a copy? Ask questions. The more you ask, the more the reporter will realize you've been around the block and will be less likely to take advantage of you. So this is, a, this is a, 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 a corner of what we normally do in a day-long training. If you were with us for a day-long training, um, you would, we would put you in front of the camera. Uh, we've done this for thousands of folks. I lift up the name of Reverend Kelly Anderson Picayo, our Director of Media and Education. She, if you're interested in going deeper with us into the media training, please reach out to Kelly. You can find her contact info at www.auburnseminary.org. I thank you for being here, and I'm so eager to listen to your questions and respond to them. Thank you, Mackie. Thank you for that wonderful presentation. Uh, we're now going into the uh, questions from the audience section, but before we do, I just want to apologize for the uh, sound difficulties that we've been having. We've been trying our best to correct that, but it hasn't been working out too well. Anyway, so let's take a few questions from our listeners. and um, Please type your questions into the box on the screen. And I'll give you a minute to do that, but we already have a few questions that have been uh, presented. From California, the question is, do you have recommendations for using language that will not be misquoted? Key to not being misquoted is to um, keep it simple, sister, the kids' principle, uh, and by that I mean you know what your core message is, have it be a simple sentence syntactically, Say it over and over again. If you don't want somebody to quote you um, saying, if you don't want something to be quoted, don't say it. Uh, I recommend that uh, if you go to a print interview, you take a little tape recorder. One of our senior trainers was a 2020 producer for 13 years. 
She never does a print interview without recording the interview. Uh, in other words, if she's being interviewed by a journalist, that way the journalist is really on her toes, on his toes. Uh, and if you do get this quoted, you can always turn that recording into an MP3 and put it on your website so that the editor approve it. I'd also tell the journalist um, that it would really uh, help you if the journalist would call you and read the quotes back that she or he plans to run. The journalist won't always do this, but half the time they will. Sometimes because they actually want to change your quote a little bit to make it fit better in uh, the article uh, or in the segment. So those are some of my tips. Okay, the uh, next question is, what is important in speaking with a producer, producer and requesting request an interview? An interview? What is it? Can you repeat that one more time? What is important in speaking with a producer when requesting an interview? Okay, so if I am requesting an interview of a producer, uh, say it's a, say it's um, Kate Moose or Trent Gillis at uh, 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 um, On Being, the Christmas at the show. And I'm trying, and I'm requesting an interview. What would be important? Uh, I think it would be important for me to know the one thing I want to communicate, know my core message. It would be important for me to know a story that brings it to life and, in a sense, to be able to. Um, Reference this story, Christopher. How can you work that story for the whole hour? If people were watching the Republican National Convention, it's extraordinary to see how Paul Ryan works the story of his father's death. How uh, Condoleezza Rice, Rice works the story of not being able to have a, a, a burger at the Woolworths counter in Birmingham, Alabama, and now being sec having had been Secretary of State. Everybody is working one story, not only for one interview, but for an entire campaign, sometimes for an entire career. So what's your message? What's the story you're telling, the story you're working? Uh, why is it relevant? What's the news? If you're, if you're pitching to a producer something that really is just not on the radar of the producer or the audience that the producer is addressing, then it's got to be pretty spectacular for it to get booked. But after the Sikh Gurdwara um, shooting, all religious voices um, suddenly have an opportunity to talk about religious freedom, religious liberty, gun violence, what it means to be sick in America, what it means to be religious in America. So again, pin it to one of those four jump ropes, and the more the better. Those are some of my tips. You need to be able to be available if you're doing press work. Um, you should have done your homework about the producer that you're speaking to to know what's relevant to that producer. Those are some of my suggestions. Okay, another question is, any suggestions for dealing with media in this election cycle? Is it possible, is it possible to get attention to anything else? That's interesting. So I would come at it from a different angle. I would say uh, the election cycle, in a sense, deals with everything. So um, you can you can cover almost any issue, uh, and it could be uh, the importance of congregational life to uh, local communities in America. You can hook that to the election cycle reporting um, in a range of ways. You could, if, if the reporter is on an election beat, then you need to speak into that election beat. Um, that said, of course, there are there are um, reporters and news outlets that are covering other issues. So again, my strategy would be to run this through the ten top tips. What do you have to say? How do you make it relevant for jump folks? Who are you trying to reach? What news outlets does that audience, that person you're trying to reach, consume? So if you're trying to reach your cousin, um, like I was in my documentary, I can actually call my cousin and say, uh, what blogs do you read? What news outlets do you um, consume, print? radio, television, where do you get your news? Where do you hear interviews? And then I would uh, 
surveyed on news outlets to see who's covering what, what kind of stories. That's how I'm going to reach my target audience. If all they, if all my target audience is receiving is news about the election, then you better believe you need to package your message in the context of the election. And that's not a bad thing. There are great opportunities for religious voices to be heard in an election cycle. Excellent. Okay, another uh, question from our listeners is, is it ever appropriate to deny an interview request? Absolutely. <laughs> Absolutely. I think that no comment or not returning a call is a dangerous move. So when a new cycle is coming down the pipe in your religious tradition or denomination, um, say you're sick and you live in um, San Diego and the shooting is taking place, and the local newspaper wants a uh, 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 quote from you, but for whatever range, range of reasons, you don't want to go on record. Maybe you're too busy, maybe you're on retreat. Um, not answering that person's call might not be to your benefit. You might be seen as uh, um, not reaching the folks you might want to, or just out of touch. What I recommend is you put a statement up on your website, uh, or on some website if you don't have one that's linked to you, that is one sentence that can be quoted in the paper that is your stand on any issue that's coming down the pike. That way, if somebody has to call you back, um, if, if the press calls you and you don't really want to take the interview, you can email that person and say, here's my quote, it's up online. That's another way to say, to, um, to not be misquoted. Um, there are snakes in the grass out there, reporters who do these interviews you don't want to take. Some of them are so extreme that you actually don't want to return their calls, and it's fine for them to say that she didn't return my call. Because the readers you're trying to reach, the listeners, the viewers, understand that that news outlet is so extreme that you would have um, no reason to engage the reporters there. But otherwise, if it's not those extreme outlets, you want to return those calls. We need to think of ourselves as a part of a larger movement, a movement of people of faith who are trying to make the world a better place. And so there are interviews you, you ought not to take because you're not the kind of pit bull who should go on Hannity or O'Reilly. You're not necessarily the kind of sporty based uh, interview that ought to go on Chris Tippett. But you want to take that call and say, oh, thank you so much for calling. I'd love to help you out. I can think of somebody you might want to talk to. And, and you lob that request to somebody who's better suited for that. It's not just about us, but it is about our large, our, our broader movement to get our voices heard. And so when you get the call from legitimate journalists, hopefully you won't just uh, not return the call, even when you know it's not for you, but instead you'll make the connection between that journalist and somebody who's right for that call. At that moment, the journalist is likely to call you back next time not only to interview you, but to get good ideas for the right person. Okay, here's another excellent question from our listeners. Do these strategies change if the journalists concerned are bloggers? Can you repeat that question? Sure. Do these strategies that you've presented change if the journalists concerned are bloggers? Okay, so I'm really glad this question was asked. Uh, yeah, no, no is the answer. Uh, look at blogs. Um, in, in our um, uh, media training manual, we have a whole section on blogging, and we've done specific trainings on blogging, and maybe we can come back and do a, a training on that topic specifically. Um, that said, blogs need to, be, need to get to the, straight to the point right away and make you care. So the golden rule of media work is know what you want to say, say it right away, and make me care. Too many blogs are rambles. They just ramble on and on. And so I'll read the first couple lines, and then I'll click away. In the first sentence of any of this media work, including blogs and others, you need to help me. And, and, and your point needs to um, be asserted immediately. And then you need to move my heart immediately through some kind of story. Story can be a sentence fragment. I was born into poverty. So were my nine brothers and sisters. That's a story. So it doesn't have to be long form. Blogs that have to be relevant. So jumping in the four jump ropes is another way that blogs are um, critical. 
Um, um, but you know what I love about blogs is that, that they're self-generated media. So though you're going to get comments, unless you turn the comment section off of your blog, uh, preparing to be caught off guard isn't quite the same uh, when you are pushing your own content out. And one of the ways that I really believe that faith leaders ought to correct the record or, or, or um, go on record is to be the first ones to go on record. Not to try to not not to try to change a bad quote in the press, and by blocking on something before the journalist ever gets to you, that's a great way to say, "Hey, wait a minute! You just quoted me. Look at this blog that I wrote two weeks ago." It's also a great way to attract journalists to you in the first place. Okay, another question comes from Washington D.C. How do you focus on the positive intersections of faith and LGBT identities while offering an authentic forum for debate? Marvelous question. So we've done deep research for years on this very topic uh, with, with deep respect for the range of points of view on the issue, but, but a real conviction, and you know, this is where I sit, um, that this is a justice issue of our time and that um, in the United States and around the world, um, it's, a basic, it, it's an issue of basic human rights. Uh, the conversations, however, are playing out around the world and in the U.S. in religious terms. And so uh, what I would say is that most importantly in the press, as well as in our communities, what needs to be heard is a, um, a diversity of religious views on the issue. Right now, generally, the press is framing the LGBT issue, the lesbian, gay, bisexual, and transgender issue, uh, as a religious anti-gay perspective and a secular pro-gay perspective. And so people who are religious but are conflicted because they know lesbian, gay, bisexual, or transgender people and love them and believe them to be good people, those people of faith are looking for the way to affirm lesbian, gay, bisexual, and transgender people from a faith perspective. If there is no Christian or Jewish or Muslim or Sikh or Jain way to be supportive of lesbian, gay, bisexual, and transgender people, then statistics say they are going to vote their conscience, their values, their faith even over their relationships. So my recommendation is that um, we create forums where the conservative and the progressive voices are heard on these issues, that they are in respectful uh, conversation. I, I move away from the word debate. I feel like the high school debate mode, is it about abomination? Is it about hospitality? Is it about um, um, picking and choosing passages in the Bible, Leviticus? Uh, I don't think that that uh, is the, I think that that polarizes folk. I think instead it's a storytelling um, conversation. It's about getting to know lesbian, gay, bisexual, and transgender people. It's about understanding why people believe what they believe and getting to know people on both sides of the, of the aisle on this issue. Understanding how people once were anti-LGBT and are now for it and have seen themselves to be better Christians better Jews, better Muslims as a result of their, their positive stand, and then having deep respect for the people who aren't standing for lesbian, gay, bisexual, and transgender equality from a faith perspective, understanding that they are fully human too, even though they don't stand for equality, and, and having um, understanding the range of ways of seeing this, it's in that place of understanding that I believe greatest compassion is found, greatest movement is found, and all are moved to stand for equality um, in God's time instead of just those who are already there. Yeah, excellent. I want to uh, thank all of our uh, listeners for those wonderful questions, and I want to thank you for joining us today for this talk with Mackie Elston. We invite you to join us for future uh, webinars, which you can learn about on our website at parliamentofreligions.org. We also invite you to stay connected to the interreligious movement through our email newsletter and by visiting our social network at peacenext.org. Org. That's peacenext.org. Today's webinar is being recorded, and the recording will be available on our website within the next few days. If you'd like to review it or share it with other folks, go right ahead. 
The vision of the uh, Council for a Parliament of World's Religions is a more just, peaceful, and sustainable world. We work to cultivate harmony among the world's religious and spiritual communities and to foster their engagement with the critical issues of our time. We send our thanks to all of you who are doing your own part for a better world. Once again, on behalf of the Council, thank you for joining us today.